The Navy. It's not just a place where Tom Cruise plays volleyball. In fact, some of the most pivotal moments in history have taken place at sea. Naval battles account for the rise and fall of many great dynasties and empires. And we're not just talking about Roy Scheider blowing up a rubber shark. Today, we're looking at several wars in history that were really won by decisive naval battles. But first, make sure you subscribe to the Weird History Channel. After that, let us know in the comments what other periods of military history you would like to hear about next. Now, damn the torpedoes, and full steam ahead! Sorry to J. Robert Oppenheimer and his award-winning cheekbones. He may have created a spooky town of scientists in New Mexico to create the atomic bomb that is widely credited with ending World War II, but in reality, the Axis's defeat was set into motion years earlier. Japanese Admiral Isoroku Yamamoto gave this surprisingly measured prophecy in 1941, before the attack on Pearl Harbor. In the first six to 12 months of a war with the United States and Great Britain, I will run wild with victory upon victory. But if the war continues after that, I have no expectation of success. Yamamoto clearly does not understand how a vision board works. But just six months after the successful attack on Pearl Harbor, Yamamoto's naval fleet suffered a shattering loss at the Battle of Midway from June 4th through the 7th, 1942. And four of the six carriers which took part in the attack on Pearl Harbor were destroyed. To paraphrase Taylor Swift, there was nothing better for the U.S. Navy than revenge. The victory reversed the early successes of the Japanese and dealt a blow the Imperial Navy would never recover from. The battle also proved once and for all the inherent superiority of the aircraft carrier against the battleship. So why is the board game called Battleship and not Aircraft Carrier? Must be too many letters to fit on the box. Hey there, weird historians! Today's video is sponsored by World of Warships. If you've ever watched one of our videos and wanted to smash some classic naval ships together like toys in a bathtub, World of Warships is the game you've been waiting for. This free-to-play title is available on both PC and consoles, and is much more than a game. It's a digital museum, showcasing intricately detailed recreations of the most fearsome vessels of the First and Second World Wars, including Battle of Midway veterans like the USS Enterprise and the USS Atlanta. You can even use ships that never even saw battle, in case you want to flex your alternate history muscles. Content is added every month including new ships and cosmetics you can use to duke it out in the game's exciting 12v12 arenas. History rarely gets so many updates, and it rarely looks this good. World of Warships has more than 40 unique maps with dynamic weather, all of which have been updated with detailed new water effects and textures that make the game's seas almost indistinguishable from the real thing as you cut through the waves with multiple different ship classes, including battleships, destroyers, cruisers, submarines, and even aircraft carriers. If you want to fly the friendly skies, World of Warships also has an active and engaged community of passionate fans and history buffs. Join the action in-game, participate in discussions on the forums and Discord channel, tune in to live streams, or even participate in tournaments. Download World of Warships now by following the link in the description, and use the code WARSHIPS to get exclusive rewards, including a bunch of doubloons, credits, premium account time, and a free ship after you complete 15 battles. Now, back to history. For all his great victories on land, Napoleon Bonaparte could never enjoy the same success at sea. Maybe because the water goes over his head even in the shallow end. <laughs> Boom, Napoleon. During the Battle of Trafalgar, Napoleon's combined Spanish-French fleet attempted to break the British Royal Navy's dominance of the waves near the southwestern coast of Spain. But the British fleet, led by Admiral Horatio Nelson, used the unconventional approach, lining up in columns to annihilate the opposing fleet. And while Nelson was fatally wounded during this battle, his fleet was absolutely victorious, and the French fleet could never fully recover. The fate of the Roman Republic was decided at sea, specifically the Battle of Actium, which despite sounding more like a Mars Volta album, was a genuine historical event with massive consequences. The fleets of Mark Antony and Octavian clashed at Actium, Greece, in 31 BCE. Octavian's fleet was led by his most capable general, Agrippa, who utilized smaller and more maneuverable ships to defeat Antony's fleet of large warships. Size does matter, just not the way you'd think. When the battle's tide was turning against them, 
Antony's main squeeze, Cleopatra, broke her ships off and fled to protect the hefty war chest of 20,000 talents. Uh, that's what they called currency back then. She didn't change course to rescue 20,000 theater majors. She would have let them sink. Broken by the defeat, Antony and Cleopatra ultimately took their own lives when Octavian's forces reached Alexandria. But at least they inspired William Shakespeare to write a play about them. We'll call that one a draw. The Russo-Japanese War of 1904 and 05 challenged the conventional view of European supremacy when the emerging power of Japan decisively defeated the Russian Empire. In a desperate bid to turn the tide of the war, the Baltic fleet was dispatched on an epic journey around the world to confront the Japanese fleet. The trip was made unnecessarily epic because the British denied the Baltic fleet access through the Suez Canal. Bit cheeky, isn't it? When the Baltic fleet clashed with the Japanese combined fleet in the Tsushima Strait, the result was a famous victory for the Japanese fleet, led by Admiral Togo Heihachiro on May 28, 1905. The opposing forces then signed the Treaty of Portsmouth, ending the war in September of that year. Admiral Togo's success saw him dubbed the Nelson of the East, after Britain's Admiral Horatio Nelson. Although, in fairness, Togo's historic victory probably should have made Nelson the Togo of the West. One of the most important battles in the Greco-Persian Wars wasn't the gallant sacrifice of the Spartans at Thermopylae, as depicted in Zack Snyder's stylized Ode to Fitness magazine's 300, but rather the Athenian-led Navy's triumph at Salamis. You remember, they sort of covered it in the sequel. Eh, who am I kidding? Nobody remembers that sequel. Ancient sources are notoriously unreliable when it comes to numbers of troops or ships, but during this battle, the Greeks were almost certainly outnumbered at least two to one. But just like Yanis Santacampo and his underdog bucks, these Greeks used a combination of tactics, skill, and understanding of terrain to pick off the ships of the larger Persian fleet. And none of them had any season-ending injuries along the way. This battle beget two other battles, of Plataea and Mycale, both of which ended in victory for the Greeks. After that, the Persians stopped trying to conquer the Greek mainland, making the Battle of Salamis a decisive turning point in this conflict. The Japanese invasion of Korea in the late 1500s stalled after a series of naval defeats at the hands of legendary Korean Admiral Yi Soon Shin. But when Yi refused to carry out a political rival's orders, because he knew how friggin' dangerous they were, he was removed from command in 1597. And in all the battles after, all but 12 Korean ships were lost. Now, that's a textbook definition of a Pyrrhic victory. After the Korean government ate a bunch of crow and their hats, and probably some crows wearing hats, they pleaded with Yi to return. The reinstated Admiral Yi chose to face the Japanese fleet in a final stand at Myongyang Strait. Outnumbered more than 10 to 1, the Korean fleet won a crushing victory that proved to be the beginning of the end of the Japanese invasion. The First Punic War was the first of three conflicts between the Mediterranean superpowers of Carthage and Rome, and ancient war nerds are constantly arguing about which one is the best. In the First War, an inconclusive campaign in Sicily raged for years, as neither side could get an edge over the other. And while Carthage maintained a slight advantage at sea to begin, the Romans made some crucial adaptations to literally turn the tides. The first was copying the design of a Carthaginian ship that washed up on the Italian shoreline. Because good artists borrow, but great artists steal. The second was to add a spiked drawbridge called a corvus. Instead of carefully maneuvering ships for ramming, the Romans simply closed the distance and used marine infantry to overwhelm the opposing ships. And thanks to Mr. Corvus, our fun nickname for the device, naval warfare changed forever. The 23-year conflict came to an end with the victory of the Roman fleet just off the coast of Sicily near the Agadian Islands. With the loss of the fleet, Carthage ceded Sicily to Rome. But in retaliation, the Italian state annexed Sardinia and Corsica in the aftermath, setting the ground for further conflicts. Never underestimate the motivating power of pettiness. One of the largest naval battles in history took place in the 16th century between the forces of the Ottoman Empire and the Holy League, led by the prominent dynasty of the House of Habsburg, which sounds more like a Bravo reality show than global power player. But we're just splitting hats. The battle, fought in the Ionian Sea around the Ottomans and Lepanto, 
involved hundreds of war galleys and about 150,000 sailors as the Holy League won a crushing victory. This was also the last major battle in the Western world fought with merely rowing ships, which was great news for sailors because manually rowing a huge war galley sucks barnacles. While the Holy League did not last long after their victorious battle, the aura of Ottoman invincibility at sea had been lifted by the defeat, which was a huge blow with long-standing repercussions. In the years prior to World War I, a naval arms race between Germany and Britain stoked tensions between the two empires. But here's the funny thing among geopolitical arms races. So much time and money went into their battleship construction that the nations that built them were reluctant to actually use them in battle. Sort of like how you'd rather sink the Lusitania than take your first edition Star Wars action figures out of their packaging. So when war did break out, a great battle between the two fleets never materialized. That is, until the Battle of Jutland in 1916, in what became essentially the only major naval battle of the war. The confrontation lasted two days, and when the smoke cleared, both sides claimed victory. Wait, what? Here's what happened. The Germans inflicted more damage on the British fleet, but the British contained the German attempt to break the blockade. Unwilling to risk another embarrassing boat-based stalemate, the Germans turned to submarine warfare though that ultimately proved to be a bit too little, a bit too late, as they wound up losing the war. So, guess we know who won the Battle of Jutland after all. The end of the Sung Dynasty came in 1279, when the Mongol Yuan Dynasty defeated a much larger fleet near Yamen, off the coast of the province of Guangdong in southern China. Shortly before the battle, the Song Dynasty's child emperor, Xiao Bing, was served an improvised dark green broth that he approvingly dubbed the Protect the Country Dish, which has since been simplified to patriotic soup and is still served today. None for us, thanks. We haven't touched green soup since The Exorcist. Unfortunately for the Song, patriotic soup was no substitute for effective tactics and skill. Despite being outnumbered more than 10 to 1, the Yuan fleet annihilated the Song to take full control of China. And according to the Chinese historical document, The History of Song, Zhao Bing's body was found in the aftermath near what's now known as the Sheku area of the Guangdong province. So for any aspiring military leaders watching, soup is not strategy. So what do you think? Which of these naval battles had the biggest effect on history? Let us know in the comments below. And while you're at it, check out some of these other videos from our Weird History.